Thank you, everybody. Today, we will be discussing enzyme technology and usage, uh, specifically how milk is transformed during dairy product manufacturing. Specifically, looking at a one-on-one -on -one level of enzyme chemistry, some of the main enzymes in milk and how you might think about how they're partitioned, where they end up, how they get into milk. And then finally, a few case studies of certain enzymes and some main reactions they cause in dairy products, things like flavor change, changing texture and coagulation. That's probably the biggest one that most dairy technologists worry about, whether it's be cheese or yogurt, those kinds of things. Okay, so now let's talk really briefly about sort of a quick and dirty way of how you can think about enzymes being partitioned in milk, and it's based on what they break down. Uh, enzymes at their core are special types of proteins that usually cause breakdown. They can build things up too, but in our case, it's mostly breaking things down. And one way they think breaking things down or breaking down fat molecules, those are called lipases. They can break down protein molecules, which are plentiful in dairy products. Those are called proteases. You may see a trend with the naming. And then finally, I take the cheater route and just say other at all, just because there's lots of different types of enzymes causing all different types of reactions. As we'll discuss, microbes at their core are just little bags of enzymes causing things to break down or things to alter and the chemistry to change. So uh, oftentimes it's nice just to lump them all together. But fat and protein breakdown are some of the most important reactions happening in dairy products, all because of enzymes. Okay, before we dive into specifically into to milk and to dairy enzymes, I want to talk really quickly about how enzymes are considered by chemists or by biochemists. Um, they're divided by classes. This is actually an internationally recognized classification system for enzymes. One type of enzymes are called hydrolases, and hydrolases break things down. Uh, for dairy ma manufacturing, an example might be lactase, which breaks down lactose. If anyone listening produces lactose-free milk, um, often that's done through either just adding an enzyme, lactase, or in conjunction with filtering out the lactose. So that's an example of a hydrolytic or hydrolase enzyme. Things called isomerases. Isomerases rearrange molecules. They sort of take a structure and switch it around. An example that might be a little harder to think about in dairy products, but it's just as applicable. The microbes are doing it, your starter cultures are doing it. Um, mesophilic starter cultures often have an enzyme called galactose isomerase, which can convert galactose into glucose. That's important because lactose is made up of galactose and glucose, but most microbes, just like us, the only type of sugar their body can really process and metabolize is glucose, so they need to transform it or make its isomer, and that's how you get the word isomerase. So even a niche area like that is used in dairy products. And then we have something called lyases. These are really specific forms of hydrolases. They break down and clip off certain parts of molecules. An example here would be histamine formation in cheese, which is the bane of many Swiss cheese makers' existence because amino acid histidine, which is a naturally occurring component of milk, uh, can be broken down by certain microbes to form histamine, and histamine can cause an allergic reaction, just like, you know, if you ever see the commercials or the ads about pharmaceuticals and antihistamine allergy medications, that's exactly what can happen, and that can happen in dairy products as well, and it can cause, uh, become a health issue if it gets out of hand. And then we have something a little more specialized, something called an oxyoreductase, just know that basically any culture you're using has this as part of their metabolic toolbox, and it's really important for them to live and thrive, um, specifically lactic acid dehydrogenase. Um, you may know lots of microbes produce lactic acid. That's what starter cultures do. Uh, but they can break that down even further in many cases. I'll talk about that briefly in a few slides. Uh, there are things called transferases. Uh, transferases sort of just move parts of the molecule around. Um, again, these are really important for lots of metabolism. Uh, glycolysis, that's just a me metabolic process that a lot of starch cultures do. It's basically the scientific word for fermentation, so breaking down lactose into lactic acid, so crucial. And finally, you have polymerases. Polymerases, as poly infers, means they're joining things together. 
Again, really important for things in these microbes metabolism. It's not so much something a cheese maker, yogurt maker, or butter maker might add um, or deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I do want to mention that enzymes are really sensitive to two main forms of threats, I like to say. Acid, H plus, that's just a standard for acid or a proton, um, can alter a structure of an enzyme affecting how well it does its job. And also heat. Um, he can denature an enzyme, since enzymes are proteins, proteins are also susceptible to heat and acid, and since enzymes are proteins, of course, they're that way too. What's important is that heat can basically cause enzymes not to work anymore. You maybe want that in some cases. Um, if you denature some of the endogenous enzymes in milk, that might prolong milk quality. Or maybe this can cause a problem. You overheat your milk with your rennet, and your rennet may become less, less effective if it's damaged in some way. So let's really quickly cover what an enzymatic process would look like. Um, I like to say enzymes make things happen. A lot of these reactions would happen on their own. They would just take many, many years to occur. Enzymes help speed that down to a fraction of a second. Uh, enzymes are really specific for what they do. Enzymes only act on certain kinds of molecules, certain kinds of ways, and certain kinds of conditions. Um, for example, a white paste, if you're producing, say, a provolone cheese, it's going to break down fat. And depending on what kind of lipase you're using, whether it's, say, an animal source, say it's from a, a calf or a kid lamb or a kid goat or a lamb, it may only break down certain kinds of fat molecules in, in high amounts. Uh, so they can be very specific, which can cause differences in flavor down the road. And then this one's sort of a fun one. Enzymes usually end with the letters A-S-C. They usually end with ACE. It's, it's a really... Simple way, if you ever see something ends with ACE, it's probably an enzyme. Whatever occurs before the ACE is usually what it breaks down. As we'll see later, lipase break down lipids, proteases break down proteins. Just a little moniker to help you remember. So at a really schematic level, what enzymes are doing um, is they attack things, what we call substrates. Substrates are basically what enzymes are acting upon. And together, we call these the reactants. These are the things that are going to react and form the chemical reaction. Um, oftentimes the enzyme will bond with the substrate or the substrate will attack the enzymes, what's called active site, which we'll talk about in a second. And then a reaction occurs. Here I'm showing a hydrolysis, a breakdown reaction, but other things can happen as well. And total we call those products, um, basically the end, the end state of what an enzyme acted on. Um, so it's a more pictorial schematic view, say that might be an enzyme. This is actually salivary amylase, an enzyme that's found in your saliva. It breaks down starch. Um, I, just, I like the picture, so let's forgive the one non-dairy example today. Um, but this could occur for basically any, any enzyme. Um, an active site is a special pocket in that enzyme. You see that little yellow molecule there, and that's where the magic's happening. That's where the breakdown is occurring. And what's actually happening when you expose enzymes to excess acid or heat is that pocket's changing shape. So now that unique puzzle fit that it had with its substrate can no longer fit in there, enzyme becomes less active. Okay, I think we've covered enough of the 101 background. Now I think we could dive into some specifics of dairy products and the enzymes that occur within them. Um, this is how I like to think about how enzymes are partitioned. I like to think about them being indigenous to milk or exogenous to milk or the dairy system, whatever product you have to be making. And even from there, we can get more specific. Um, enzymes can be indigenous to the milk itself. They can be things that are basically left over from the cow's metabolism that got carried right along with the milk. Or they can be indigenous to the milk by the fact that milk isn't sterile, that has lots of interesting bacteria, yeast, and other microbes growing in it. And each one of those microbes, like I said earlier, bags of enzymes. So that native flora is a huge pool of potential enzymatic activity. And then we have exogenous enzymes, I like to call them. And these are things basically that are added either directly or indirectly by the dairy technologist or the cheese maker or the yogurt maker. And these could be things like if you're adding starter cultures, starter cultures, the actions they're doing are all because of enzymes. Maybe you're adding adjunct cultures or molds or flavor producing cultures, all that's enzymatic based at the end of the day. Or they can be added directly. A famous example of an enzyme most dairy people add directly is rennet or coagulants. That's a protease that breaks down the protein. 
Um, but maybe you can add other enzymes too, like sometimes you're adding a white paste to, to encourage flavor development more quickly. Okay, now I want to go through each one of these four really quickly, and then we're going to dive into some case studies of each, and that will basically take us through today's talk. So let's first talk really quickly about some of the classes, I like to call them, of indigenous milk enzymes. Uh, some of these enzymes break things down, lipases and proteases being the most common ones. These are ones we talked about. They break down lipids and proteins. Uh, the image I'm showing here is an example of what a lipase would do. It takes a triglyceride, where this molecule is, and breaks it down into free fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. Uh, we're going to discuss that in more depth here in a minute. Milk also has plasmin, which is a protease that breaks down protein, basically an enzyme that breaks down the casein micelle, which if that's in really high amounts and left to its own devices can cause bitterness. So that's something to be aware of. But most pasteurization steps take care of it. Or if it's a cheese that has any age on it, there's other enzymes out competing in any way, the protein's breaking down through some other means. Um, enzymes in milk can be used as a marker for thermal history. Alkaline phosphatase is a common assay. Um, if you want to tell if a milk has been heated to the proper amount, um, oftentimes you can't just measure what kind of bacteria is in it because the bacteria you end up with matters how many you started with. So you may have pasteurized it enough, but it started off at a high load. You don't really know if it reached the time temperature combination legally. An alkaline phosphatase assay is the standard method to test the adequacy of pasteurization. We'll talk about that more in depth here in a minute. Um, measuring presence of enzymes can be a good marker for how the health of the cow was when it was milked, uh, the state of infection. Um, acidic cows, cows suffering from mastitis, uh, you know, in infection state, uh, they'll have high amounts of catalase. Uh, catalase is a marker for many of the immune cells that are sort of being sloughed off into the milk. Um, and a common test for catalase is adding hydrogen peroxide to a sample, and if you produce oxygen, um, bubbling, you can see it, if it produces bubbles, that means, you know, high catalase results, that could be a sign of an infectious um, or a sick, sick milking animal. And then there are enzymes naturally present in indigenous in milk that are natural antimicrobials. Some people on the call may be aware that this is especially true with a lot of whey processing. You'll add hydrogen peroxide to help preserve or to help extend the shelf life of certain liquid dairy products. Whey is really common. Um, in the United States, it's done in some other countries as well. And uh, it's often a, mis a misnomer that people think the hydrogen peroxide itself is the disinfectant or the antimicrobial. It is actually not, it's activating what's called the lactoperoxidase system in milk. This is a really well studied an built in antimicrobial system milk has, which is pretty cool, in which you have hydrogen peroxide reacting with lactoperoxidase to form what's called a thiocyanate ion, which is. Um, it alters that ion, which is all this is naturally present in milk. And that's what actually does the antimicrobial effect. So it's, it's pretty cool that you add an ingredient to activate a natural antimicrobial in milk. Okay, now I want to talk about flora really quick. This is really where cultures come in, whether it's starter cultures, adjunct cultures, natural cultures. And that deserves a whole talk in itself. And basically what I like to say is that Everything but the kitchen sink, you can talk about cultures and enzymes, because at the end of the day, these are living organisms with complex metabolisms, and those enzymes performing those metabolic reactions are very complex, and we can't really cover all of them today. We'll talk about them here or there, specifically as we go on today. Uh, but to give you an idea of how complex, this is just an example of one metabolic pathway that one starter culture might have, and it's doing different things. And most people, when they look at this, they look to very befuddled look. Uh, but it's, it's really not much to, to bother ourselves with as long as the cultures are doing their job. And as a quick aside, I'd like to point out that it was much harder to find a confused look of, of Mr. Morrison here than it was of Trump. When I swapped out that picture, it took me a, it took me a couple extra minutes in finding a, a picture of our fearless leader over here. So here's an example of a either native flora or added flora. Lactobacillus helveticus is often added nowadays, um, but it's also naturally present in some types of cheeses, especially the ones that have high cook temperatures. Helveticus implies it's a thermophile. Uh, this is added a lot now, especially in industrial cheddar producing, to reduce bitterness or to give sweeter fruity flavors. The, the fruity flavor associated with 
say Parmesan or an aged Swiss cheese is often because of Lactobacillus hereticus. And also the crystals you find in those kinds of aged Dutch, Italian, or um, Alpine style cheeses are resulting of this metabolism. And what is going on is proteolysis. It contains a boatload of proteolytic enzymes that are really efficient at breaking down casein protein into peptides and then breaking all those down into individual amino acids, uh, which sort of accomplishes the debittering step. And these amino acids, when they reach high enough amounts, can react with other things, cause sweet flavors, and they can also crystallize out. So that's just one example, one really, really niche example of one specific microbe in its enzymatic chemistry, which is pretty neat. Okay, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about probably the most important part of enzymatic pathway in starter cultures, and that is the fact that we use and depend on them to create acid to acidify our milk, to culture our milk and many different dairy products, whether it be cheese or yogurt or cultured butter, anything like that. And so often we think about two main sets of microbes being involved with the culturing step of a dairy product and mesophiles and thermophiles, and they have different unique sets of enzymes which cause different end products. Mesophiles, for example, have lactase, they have that hydrolase, they're able to break down lactose into galactose and glucose. And as I mentioned earlier, they have that isomerase, so they can, they can convert that to lactose into glucose, and that glucose can be processed to form four times the amount of lactic acid for every molecule of lactose. Thermophiles, on the other hand, I had a big asterisk here, there's lots of subvariants of these microbes that may have it, but generally they lack or have smaller amounts of that isomerase, so they can't form as much glucose. That means that sugar builds up, and since that sugar isn't converted into something that can be fermented by this microbe, it builds up, it builds up, and not that things would taste sweeter, uh, but that can go through what's called Maillard browning and form uh, burning, and this is really a problem in lots of, any cheese is meant to be cooked with, really. I just want a quick reminder, I'll be talking about um, acid throughout this talk a little bit and pH. Just a quick reminder, it's inverse relationship. So if I ever say something's higher acid, it's equivalent to saying lower pH and vice versa. Sometimes I use those interchangeably and it can be a little confusing. I say high acid, low pH really quick. It might sound a little jarring. Uh, but the story doesn't end there. So we just saw how lactic acid could be formed or not formed, depending. And and the type of culture being used. But again, these microbes, depending on what ones you're adding as adjuncts, offer a whole suite of enzymatic possibilities as far as what can be formed. On starter lactic acid bacteria and its lab, um, they can have a different type of isomerase that converts lactic acid into what you call DL lactate or DL lactic acid. Um, that's important because that is more prone to crystallization. So you might get more calcium lactate crystals on your cheddar if you happen to have a microbe that is that enzyme being overproduced. Corpiani bacteria have a whole suite of enzymes that produce things like carbon dioxide to give the eyes of Swiss cheese and different proteases to give the, the nutty flavors of Swiss cheese. Um, surface ripening microbes, those are really proteolytic. They'll break down, um, not only they're very proteolytic, they're very lipolytic. They have lots of enzymes that can break down lactic acid into some really, really small substituent parts, small as water or carbon dioxide. And other microbes can form all sorts of other products as well. Like I said, this deserves us a whole, own, whole talk, but I think we can leave it here saying that um, even the starter cultures you're using, it may seem simple at the end of the day, just they need to make lactic acid, but lots of them also have secondary, tertiary, and quaternary enzymatic pathways that can form all sorts of interesting compounds. Um, Slightly related, but I love showing this graph. I'm a big graph person. Some people garden on the weekends for fun. I, I like to make graphs. And here it's just a quick relationship showing how pH, again, increasing pH means low acidity over here, high acidity over here since the number is lower, relates to calcium content. That increases as we go up. And you can clearly see some relationships right away that form. Um, I've just sort of plotted these cheeses um, as at time of eating the pH and the calcium that they might have. As you see right away, there's a relationship there that it's a higher pH cheese, it probably has more calcium. And that has to do with how much acid is produced and sort of dissolves calcium from the casein matrix and it sort of flows out with the whey. Just think of acid dissolving calcium in your teeth. Same thing happens in cheese, basically, into the casein myself. But there are a few other things going on too, which are interesting. You see the acid set cheeses here, since these 
produce acid over a really long time, you know, many hours, overnight in some cases, they really leach away a lot of calcium and that can cause really low calcium content over time. And then finally, they have ones over here, uh, which are really interesting. Uh, the astute observer might notice all these are mold ripen. And that's important because mold are really, really enzymatically active. All of this was basically a big roundabout way to talk about how molds are really enzymatically active and they like to break down everything. They like to break down lactic acid even. So these, these cheeses actually, day one, the uh, pH of brie or blue cheese is about the same as a feta or Cheshire. It's a very acidic cheese. Uh, but over time that mold grows, it eats that acid and that buffers the pH back up. So I have this a cool little relationship that all comes about because of just the enzymatic portfolio these microbes have. Okay, let's get back and talk really quickly about um, the last class, I like to call them uh, the direct edition. You may say, oh, well, this, this slide's pretty plain compared to the other ones. And that's because the rest of today's discussion, we're gonna dive into each one of these into a little more detail. And let's, let's do that. So the first one I wanna talk about was the one I sort of mentioned in passing at the beginning. This is an indigenous milk enzyme uh, called alkaline phosphatase. Uh, just a real quick, some background knowledge for that. Um, that's really important for milk microbiologists because as we all remember, there are two types of microbes you find in milk. There are ones that can make you sick, which are pathogens, and there's ones that sort of make, can make yogurt or cheese taste not so good, and that, those are spoilage organisms. Alkaline phosphatase is really about the former. It's about trying to detect uh, the, the things of food safety concern, the pathogens, not so much the food quality or spoilage organisms. Um, just a quick fun aside, many, food quality and spoilage organisms often have much more robust enzymatic systems than pathogens. And we can probably be thankful for that because these often through our normal means of whether it be pasteurization or any other hurdles, acid, salt, they usually wither or can't grow very well. But lots of these types of microbes can grow and persist for very long times and their enzymes are really robust. Uh, it's luckily it only can mean differences in flavor or texture, not necessarily making anyone sick. So that's you can be thankful for nature for, for that enzymatic fact right there. Uh, but with that in mind, uh, we could talk a little bit about pasteurization now. Um, as many people on the call are I'm sure aware of, is uh, pasteurization refers to the, the, the heating step of milk and pasteurization specifically refers to a specific time and temperature combination. Uh, here I have you know, two most common ones recognized by law. It's the same law for you guys as it, as it is here in America. And it's if you can't reach the time temperature combos there, uh, high, you know, HTST, high temperature short time being the 72C for 15 seconds, or the LTLT, -LT, low temperature long time, uh, 63C for 30 minutes. If you can't reach that, then it's technically raw milk, versus if you're able to get over that and reach that time temperature combination, it's considered pasteurized. What's important is that that time temperature combination also affects enzymes in milk, and that's where all this is leading up to. Uh, here I've plotted some what are called thermal death curves, and what that means is on the y-axis here we have time, on the x-axis here we have temperature, so there's a time-temperature relationship coming back. What's important is if you look at any one of these lines, anywhere you trace along that line means that is being killed or deactivated at that temperature. Um, so we can use coliform bacteria as an example. So at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, um, this actually should probably, this actually should be uh, Celsius. Um, for once, an American put Fahrenheit, we should put Celsius, isn't that funny? Um, at one second, it has been destroyed. Versus up here at 65, it takes 10 seconds. You can sort of see how that works. Uh, what's important for our purposes is if you see, there's some really common, not so much anymore, um, typhus bacterium and the thing that causes tuberculosis bacterium and also Coxiella brevetti is here as well. Um, they all fall along these lines. What you notice, there's another line right above it sort of parallel to it. That's just slightly hotter and slightly longer, and that's alkaline phosphatase. So that means if we test milk and we don't find any alkaline phosphatase left, we denature that enzyme with the heat, uh, we can be confident since its thermal death curve is above these microbes, the ones we're concerned with here, the pathogens, that we've probably almost assuredly destroyed those pathogens. So as you can see, Phosphatase today is a great stand-in or a great way of measuring the adequacy of pasteurization because this thermal death time curve has a similar slope or angle, 
and it's also slightly more resistant, meaning it's, you know, give ourselves a little bit of a safety check, a little bit of a wiggle room. Okay, now we're going to talk about perhaps the most famous enzyme in dairy product manufacturing, at least the ones that involve coagulation. So this could be things like uh, cultured milk products, like yogurts, it could be things like cheese, those kinds of things. And we're talking about rennet, which is a protease. So rennet in dairy manufacturing circles is often used as a catch-all. Um, it's basically any type of coagulant used to turn solid curd from liquid milk. And again, it makes things happen. And just like any other enzymes, temperature, acidity can affect it. And not only does it coagulate milk, which may be its main purpose, that sets the stage for all sorts of future things. At the end of the day, most dairy product manufacturing is just to control dehydration. In order to dehydrate a liquid, you need to make a solid out of it. And without rennet or without a coagulant, you won't be able to do that. And again, since you're removing water, in many cases, you're concentrating what's left. That creates a great chemical playground for reactions to happen. Things like flavor and texture development, and aided by other enzymes, of course, as well. And just a quick reminder, I love to repeat myself if you couldn't tell. Um, a quick idea of what's going on is you have an enzyme attacking a substrate. Here's that active site and it's causing a reaction to happen, in this case, a breakdown. And I will go into this in more depth of what Ren is doing to casein here in a second. First, I want to talk about the types of Ren, or types of coagulants that are really common in the dairy industry and some of their uh, more nuanced points. Uh, we have veal rennet. This is you know, the most traditional type of rennet, the one that comes from the calf stomach. It's, but what's interesting here, and uh, Maybe we should bowl this. It's a mixture of what's called chymosin and pepsin. It's not a pure enzyme. It is a mixture of enzymes. And that's important because that means it, it may be a little less efficient than the industrial rennets used, but it also means it can create more interesting, diverse flavor profiles since it's not as pure. It's not as specific in its breakdown since it contains a mixture of enzymes. These are both enzymes. As I mentioned, uh, since it is a mixture of enzymes, it can create very complex flavors, which depending on what you're trying to do, can be desirable or not. Consistency is your main goal, and this maybe is not for you because this is a natural product. It's not one that's been engineered like one we'll talk about here in a minute. It's also not vegetarian since it came from a slaughtered calf. And by comparative purposes, it's pretty expensive since it is very well dictated by the, by the veal market. In fact, so much so now that uh, the rennet market determines the veal market, not the other way around, which is pretty funny. And the what are called microbial rennets. These are derived by, by things like mold or fungi, and they're really cheap because basically it's very easy to grow mold industrially. You just put it in a tank with some media and it grow up, they can extract out the enzyme, and it's vegetarian. And they're pretty common. These, these are especially common in the later part of the 20th century, um, but they're still used in many places, but they've sort of been overtaken by more fancy industrial rennets. Uh, specifically, fermentation produced chymosin or FPC. Um, this is a enzyme coagulant that's produced via recombinant DNA methods. And that's just a fancy way of not freaking out consumers calling them GMOs. Um, basically what they're doing is taking the gene from the baby calf and inserting it into a microbe. They use E. coli often, uh, non-pathogenic forms of E. coli. And they basically hijack the E. coli inner machinery and grow up lots and lots and lots of this enzyme. And since it's a pure enzyme, they're just genetically engineered to be pure, um, very good consistency, but maybe not as complex because of that purity. And it's sort of right in the middle. It's, it's very value added. There's different types of these you can buy now. You can get camel chymosin, which is supposed to be the best for long age cheddar because it, it causes the least amount of bitter peptide formation. You can get really fancy with these now. Then you have thistle remnant, perhaps some of the most I don't want to say rudimentary, but some of the most rudimentary rennets, these come from plants. Um, cardoon thistle is a very common one. Fig sap can also be used. Um, basically, all these plant-based rennets can coagulate milk, uh, but they are very nonspecific, and they can cause bitterness in a hurry because of how proteolytic they are. The, the, prote the protease enzymes they have are really, really efficient, and they like to go to town. Uh, but they are vegetarian by definition. They're very expensive. Um, for example, the really common in a lot of Portuguese cheeses, it's very often a historical cheese being made with these, not really, I don't know anyone who's developing new types of cheese nowadays who's using thistle rennet. It's usually used for traditional purposes. 
And then you have what's called rennet paste. Uh, rennet paste is a combination of rennet and other enzymes. Oftentimes, traditionally, this is made by just grinding up that stomach. That stomach contains more than just the enzyme to break down fat. But just like our stomachs, it contains enzymes to break down fat, protein, carbohydrates. Uh, so it can give um, lots of interesting flavors. It does have a lot of white paste, which breaks down fat, which is the key flavor of provolone. And since it is basically just a ground-up stomach, it's not vegetarian. Uh, but a lot of Italian cheesemakers swear by this, especially produce some of the more piquant or flavorful things like Romano. Okay, now that we covered some of the types of rennet, let's talk about what it's doing in milk and its proteolysis step. So before we get to the breakdown of casein micelle, let's build one up and see what's inside of it. Uh, just to give an idea of casein micelle, the scale we're working at is about 100 nanometers, which means you need about 1,000 of them across a uh, human hair, unless you're a redhead, which I learned recently. Redheads have thicker hair, so think more like 1,500 casein micelles. Uh, use that for your next pickup line at the bar, see how well it does for you. Uh, hopefully you have better luck than I did. Uh, but if you look at a casein micelle, here's sort of the general arrangement of its pieces. On the outside, you have what are called kappa casein, these hairs. That they keep them, these micelles from sticking together, which we'll see in a minute. And embedded in the middle, you have all the other types of casein. There's alpha, beta, things we're not too concerned with here. And all holding it together is calcium. And I'm sounding a broken record, but calcium is really important for all aspects of dairy manufacturing, even if it's not specific to enzymes. And shrouded in all this, because that hairy layer is a negative charge, just like two magnets with the same charge repel each other, all these negatively charged casein micelles repel each other, keep them in the liquid state. So what is happening when you add rennet, or any other coagulant for that matter, um, to how specific it is depending on the coagulant, is that kappa casein is being transformed, it's being broken down by that rennet. So here comes that rennet enzyme and is cleaving a really specific area, it's active site. This little pocket is cleaving a very specific part of that protein. It's cleaving a specific, what we call a peptide bond between two amino acids, or it's molecular level we're talking about here. And what that does is form two separate pieces, what we call paracappa casein, which is a very scientific name you don't need to be concerned with. And then these little hairy layer, which has that negative charge, which sometimes go by the name glycomacropeptide or casinomacropeptide. What's important now is now that this is free, this ends up in the whey portion of your, che of your cheese or of your yogurt. It drains away, which means this is no longer negatively charged. They can stick together. So sort of a macro view of what's going on. You have those casein micelles shrouded that negative charge because of the kappa casein. You add your coagulant, it sort of shaves off that hairy layer with it, the negative charge, and that allows them to aggregate together and to coagulate. And as you might imagine, this happens trillions and trillions of times over and over again. What you happen to get is a KC matrix and embedded in it is fat, residual whey, minerals, some starter cultures along for the ride, all sorts of things. So that's what's happening when you coagulate. Uh, and it really doesn't matter what kind of dairy product you're making. This process is pretty similar for all of them. And again, I'd be remiss if every other slide I didn't mention that calcium along the way is really helping this happen. Um, so a different way of looking at it, if you're more graphically minded like I am. Um, so on here, we're gonna have the coagulation process over time. On this axis, we have that kappa casein cleavage. Remember, we're shaving off those hairs. And we're going to split this in two main parts. The first part is the so-called coagulation step, so-called enzymatic step. And what happens here is you add your K, you add your rennet or your chymosin or your thistle rennet, whatever you have, and certain things happen. So what happens is it clips off those hairs. As you can see, two main things happen in this part of the graph. This green line went up, meaning you shaved off most of this kappa casein hair, is about 85%. But viscosity went down slightly, and this is something really experienced cheesemakers often ask me about, and they notice it, that right after they add rennet, I mean right after, seconds after, um, they feel like, I feel like the milk got a little thinner, and it did. And it's, it's pretty cool if you think about what you did, you shaved off all those hairs, you made those casein micelles less sticky, basically, um, at least temporarily. I mean, just think about rubbing tennis balls together versus rubbing golf balls together. The smoother ones sort of flow past each other. Um, 
to a degree, and that lowers the viscosity very slightly for a short time until this 85% number is reached. And then it jumps right back up because you reach the second phase of coagulation. And that's when those KC micelles come together. And that's what we showed you on the previous slide. So that's sort of just a quick recap we just covered more graphically and more complicated since I'm a scientist. Um, and now the pictorial version, um, just if you're more visually minded, like, like many people are, myself included, I love making these animations. You have the enzymatic phase caused by that rennet, and that's going to shave off those kappa casein hairs. And remember, we're targeting about 85%, and once that happens, you reach sort of a critical mass of them being able to stick together. And that's the non-enzymatic phase. And they form flocks, how we like to say, flocculation starts to occur, the milk starts to get a little thicker. Those flocks come together and can form a solid mass, we call it gel or coagulum. And then again, that builds up. And when it first happens, I think anyone who's made dairy prognosis, you know, it's what we call a weak set. It's a, it's a really weak gel and it can get firmer over time. And what's happening actually is those KC micelles are rearranging themselves forming thicker strands with bigger pockets of whey. And that's what's causing that firmness to occur. And say then you're going to cut this up or you're going to do a cooking step and you're going to stir it, uh, that causes this coagulated mass or the gel to contract and to lose moisture. Now, I went through this entire process. I just want to say this is all started with the action of a single enzyme, that protease. And without it, you didn't set the stage for any of this to occur. You didn't set the stage for moisture loss, which is often the main goal with many dairy products, not only to make something that tastes good. And you may hear this process note called syneresis in technical circle, circles. That is the same way of saying whey loss, moisture removal, and these are all synonyms for each other. Okay, so now let's put it all together. Um, we, we looked at it, and I'll just look at it graphically really quick. On the x-axis, we have the whole process. On the y-axis, we have firmness. And if we look right away, you can sort of think of it this way. Um, I'm not going to, I'll pull back the curtain here and name the steps right away, but I think we can all know that if there's zero firmness, it probably means liquid step, and then we reach a step where things get thicker. Um, as you might imagine, uh, this is where the coagulation is actually occurring. You don't have liquid milk until coagulation occurs, and once that happens, firmness goes up. The time in which you get that increased firmness um, is known as flocculation time. And then this middle part of the process here, uh, you have what's called a gel rearranger. Remember, those strands got thicker, pore sizes got bigger. Uh, this is what actually sometimes dictates the variety of cheese you're making, whether you cut it and your cut size is important, but also how firm the gel is when you cut it is also important. That has to do with the size of those pores, how much moisture you're going to lose. And then finally, the last step, the quote unquote, the, the gel uh, contraction. And that's really temperature influence. Like if you're making a soft cheese like a brie, you're not cooking anything. Um, or if you're making things like yogurt, you're not cooking it to heck like you are, say, a, a Parmesan or Italian style cheese or a, a Swiss style cheese. So there we covered a little bit of rennet and its coagulation process. So one big case study of a really specific enzyme. I now want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about lipases and proteases. And these enzymes are important for flavor and texture development in many different dairy products. So we'll be talking about cheese specifically because that's sort of the easier one to talk about because that's where really intense flavors occur. So it's really easy examples to pull out. But these are also crucial for things like the flavor of cultured butter as well. So before I talk about lipases, things that break down fat, I want to talk about the, the substrate material, which are fat globules. Um, fat globules here, um, they come in a variety of sizes, unless you're homogenizing, that sort of equalizes the size, but that's relatively uncommon in most cheese varieties, unless it's a special case like blue cheese or something like that. Um, 200 microns, so those people paying attention, these are uh, these are very, very large. They're larger than KC micelles, for example. What's important is they have what is called a membrane on the outside, a, a milk fat globule membrane, you might hear it called. And it's a really, really complex membrane as far as science and biochemistry is concerned. So what's called is a lipid trilayer. If you count the layers here, you have one, two, three of these squiggly things, those are phospholipids. And just a quick little trivia fact that I love. When I discovered this, it made sense, but I never thought about it beforehand. But 
odd numbers aren't very common in nature, and lipid trilayers definitely aren't common in nature. Anyone who's done biology 101 knows a lot of our cells have membranes, but they're always bilayers. So where's this extra layer coming from? What's actually interesting is when a fat globule is formed, as you might imagine, in, in the udder, in the cistern of a cow, it's being pushed through a cell into where the milk is basically being formed. So this outer membrane actually started off in its infancy as the cell membrane inside the cow, which I think that's, again, another cool fact to impress your friends at the pub later on tonight. Uh, but what is important is outside this membrane is the serum. This is the watery portion of milk. This is where lots of things are occurring. Enzymes are out here, which is important for our discussion. And through all these layers is what's called triglycerides, and that's the main structure of fat. When they're kept intact, protected like this, they're not much flavor at all. But if this layer is violated, say through excess pumping or excess shear, you can expose more of that triglyceride core. And not only can enzymes get to it that cause maybe quote unquote desirable or undesirable flavors, depending on the case, but oxygen can also get in there too. And also enzymes called lipoxygenases, which help oppose the oxidation of fat. And while lipases have good and bads, I've never heard anyone who wants more oxidized fatty flavor in their dairy products. So I think that's almost always a negative one. And again, those enzymes can be naturally present in the milk. And it all has to do with how the milk is naturally protecting that fat and keeping the enzyme partitioned away. There's a quick recap of some of the nomenclature. Here you have um, a triglyceride. It's tri because it has one, two, three fatty acids collected to a glycerol. And a really quick, fun example I'd say is it can, the breakdown of a triglyceride because of lipase, the enzyme, can create something as really romantically flavored as aged provolone cheese, like baby vomit, uh, started with something as plain tasting as milk, all because of this one reaction, formation of free fatty acids, which I think is pretty neat. Okay, so let's, again, I love to repeat myself, let's take it step by step. You have the intact triglyceride with fatty acids like this, not much flavor or aroma. Um, it's it's pretty common way of thinking, big bulky things don't taste or smell like much, they're too big to interact with our olfactory glands. The addition of a lipase enzyme forms free fatty acids. These now can float up, interact, and smell, and cause flavor. Um, but what's important with these fatty acids, like I mentioned earlier, lipases can clip some of these off preferentially, uh, which we'll talk about in the next slide as far as animal flavors. But really quickly, a quick aside, um, you go to this link, um, it's hosted on one of the websites I run, and it talks a little bit about the length of fatty acids and the flavors they cause, uh, which I think is a pretty cool uh, thing to think about. Fatty acids occur in multiples of two, carbon out of length, the actual chemistry doesn't matter, but if you're ever curious, again, you want to, you know, don't have much to do on the weekend, you come here and slide this along and see what kind of flavors are caused by certain fatty acids. Butyric acid here, that's just four carbon atoms long. Um, that causes the key flavors in things like provolone, uh, Romano cheese. To get a little longer, six through 10, we call these medium chain fatty acids. And anyone who's a Latin scholar might see something here, caprolic acid, acrylic acid, capric acid, caprine. These are all words for goat. As you might imagine, these are really important for goat cheese flavor. And the enzymes, the lipase is naturally endemic in goats, preferentially clip off these. And you can get longer, you get sort of more defective type flavors. Okay, let's, let's dive back into the, into the fun stuff. Of course, it doesn't end there. Just like we learned that lactic acid is only an intermediary. These enzymes can be found in milk itself. They can be most commonly found in starter cultures or adding all sorts of enzymes that transform these fatty acids to other things. Um, you can have what's called cyclization reactions, which are making circular compounds, things like lactones. Um, lactones are really common milky or buttery flavors. So if you think of things like mascarpone cheese or buttery gouda, this kind of chemistry is really important. Um, you have the enzymes that cause the reaction to other types of molecules. Um, anyone who remembers basic chemistry knows that an acid combines with an alcohol, you get what's called ester compounds. These are really important because these cause fruity flavors. Um, if you think about the flavor of Parmesan cheese I go back to, or the fun fruity flavors of things like an aged alpine cheese, those microbes that are naturally in those cheeses are added 
uh, have enzymes that form lots of esters. And then you can have other, you can have all sorts of other molecules forming as well. Uh, for one example, I like to think about is either blue cheese, blue mold, or white mold. They contain enzymes that are what are called, those are those oxioreductases that we mentioned earlier. They change the oxidation state of fatty acids. So a certain ketone may have a blue cheese flavor, 2-heptanone, that started off as a fatty acid. The mold altered it via its enzymatic system to be blue cheese flavor. Or perhaps a white mold, penicillium camembertii, contains an enzyme system that ox, uh, reduces this all the way down to an alcohol compound, and this can form that mushroom or earthy aroma that is really common in a lot of white mold cheeses, all because of enzymes. Really quickly, we'll talk about sheep and goat milk flavor. We're going back to these medium chain fatty acids that we mentioned, looking at them between goat, sheep, and cow. And as you can see, highlighted here for you, if you look at the total amounts of these, goat has almost twice as much as cow milk, and sheep definitely falls, falls in there as well. And this is what really causes the animalic flavor of these products, the goatee or sheepiness. Uh, specifically, it contains a certain type of fatty acids that are really common in goat milk. And these goats, through evolution, have enzymes and lipases that sort of naturally preferentially clip these off. And this sort of explains why goat meat, uh, goat meat, well, that too, but goat milk smells like Goats, uh, goat milk tastes like goat smell. There we go. Delicious way of putting that. And then you have things like phenolic compounds in sheep that cause a lot of these flavors as well. Not directly related to our discussion of enzymes, but what kind of academic would I be if I didn't include spurious information? So now we looked at lipases, which break down lipids or fats. Now let's look at proteases, which break down proteins. We already looked at rennet, so we sort of know the basics of protein breakdown here. Uh, but proteases can break down proteins into peptides, uh, basically smaller pieces of proteins. Some of those are very bitter. If anyone's ever had a really bitter cheddar, it's due to bitter peptide formation. And then proteases or peptidases, you might hear them referred to, can break down these peptides into smaller pieces, which are less bitter or free amino acids. These amino acids can crystallize, like I mentioned, they can react with other things, they themselves can contribute flavor. Um, so it's sort of a, a balance you have to strike here as far as what kind of flavors you're getting. And many times you may hear things called debittering cultures. What debittering cultures really are, are just cultures that have lots of these kinds of enzymes, the ones that break down bitter peptides into free amino acids. A side part of that, not only is fewer bitter things, but a lot of these are sweet tasting. So it's sort of a two for one, Two, two birds, one stone kind of situation going on. And of course, protein can be breaking down to many different things. Uh, sometimes you have enzymes that are forming ammonia compounds. And anyone who's spending time in a cheese ripening room knows that. You can have enzymes that are clipping off sulfur groups from amino acids. So think of the AE kind of cheddary flavor you might get from some cheeses and lots of other things as well. But Flavor chemistry and the enzymes related to that. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about texture. Um, proteases not only break down proteins in both regards to flavor, but they break down to texture as well. Um, a fun way to think about it is if you think about you know, how cheddar was traditionally made, maybe bandage wrapped, coated in lard, um, moisture could leave, and that sort of makes sense why the cheese is getting crumbly and more dry. The water's leaving, it's, it's actually getting more dry. But lots of us made cheese this way now. It spends its life aging in plastic, but that indeed does still get crumblier and drier feeling over time, even if moisture has nowhere to go because of the plastic. So what's going on? Well, of course, proteolysis and enzymes to the rescue. That is what's going on. Here, this is an example of peptide chain. This is what a protein would look like from a chemist's point of view. Here, what's called a peptide bond. Not really important the exact name, but what is important is enzymes, proteases, and this can happen on its own as well with a long enough time, years and years and years, uh, months and months and months. With the presence of water, we'll break down this peptide chain into smaller pieces, and that causes the structure to change, to get more crumbly and to get drier. And you can see that sort of water molecule is used up in that process. And that's, that's how hydrolase gets its name, by the way, because hydro is a water molecule that's used. Sometimes you're doing this intentionally. In this case, anyone who's making blue cheese knows the structure gets really, really soft over time. And that's because you're adding a mold, which has lots of proteolytic enzymes. 
that's basically chopping up that protein matrix into smaller and smaller pieces, really making that texture um, really soft, really meltable, can't hold onto the fat anymore. You've, you've completely disrupted that curd matrix at this point, but all for intentional purposes because that was what that cheese is supposed to be. With that, I'd like to thank you. Open up to any questions you have. I know we went through a lot here, but enzymes are a really important part of many different dairy products. And I think understanding a little bit more about their chemistry and being more deliberate with understanding them can really help you, especially tweak a process later on. Fantastic. Thank you, Pat. That was so good. And um, you really cater for people who learn in different ways, whether or not it's visual or actually doing things, it's fantastic. Um, can I just ask, while well, we're waiting for questions, um, that, that fatty acid um, flow chart that you did, we you know with moving, that you swapped over to, is that on your cheesescience.org website? It is, yeah, I have a post about fatty acids. Yes, okay then. So um, people, I highly recommend you check out Pat's cheesescience.org website. You'll be able to spend your weekend looking through that. Thank you, Jenny. I try not to plug myself too much, so thank you for doing it on my behalf. <laughs> okay, then. Um, just one other question I had um, was the role of enzymes you briefly mentioned in butter processing. Could you just explain a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty niche case because butter being mostly fat, lipases are often the bane of butter makers' existence because any residual lipase left in that milk later on will cause lots of quality detriments in your butter. You'll get lots of those rancid flavors, which are never wanted in butter. So they have to take a lot of steps to make sure that they don't overactivate those enzymes. That can be heat treating the milk a little harder than usual, or often it's being a little more deliberate with that milk and not treating it as roughly to keep those fat globule membranes intact. Uh, so less of that enzyme has a chance to attack the fatty core. All right, very good. Okay, so folks, we really would like some questions, please. Just give it a couple of minutes here. I'll just pause the recording. Pat, could you read out Alice's question? Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll just read it out. So um, basically the, the thrust of the question is rennet paste is a mixture of chymosin, pepsin, lipases, all different types of enzymes. And would that react any differently in that format versus being added separately? Um, you're gonna love this answer. It's hard to say, and it depends, of course. I have to waffle with my answer. Uh, but it can, it can definitely be different, especially if the specific separate ones you're adding. If you're just adding liquid chemicals, um, some of those could all be microbial based. They could all be engineered. Um, where if you're adding a rennet paste, traditionally it's coming with a certain animal. And anyone who does a lot of Italian cheese making knows some of them swear that the only light paste they want to use comes from uh, lamb or kid goat. Uh, so when you're adding a rennet paste, which is sort of a mixture coming from a single type of animal, um, you, you might get a different flavor profile at the end versus adding everything separately. Unless you're doing a lot of experimentation and mixing and matching to try to match the exact profile of each of those. Um, separate enzymes directly. But at the same time, what you trade off in maybe different interesting flavors, you might gain in consistency. Uh, because if you add you know, the same dosage of each of those every time and you can run off to your favorite ingredient supplier or culture house, uh, they're doing a good job making consistent. So it, it really is a give and take. Okay, that's it. Um, look, another question I just had, and then I, I typed it in, and then I thought, no, I'm not going to type it in, but um, which of the rennets are actually vegan? But that takes away from us talking about, you know, we're representing dairy here. So what's the point of having vegan rennets when we're making dairy cheeses? But Pat, are you able to answer that question? Yeah, so I mean, any of the ones that, that I call vegetarian or also be considered vegan, basically, well, I'm not sure if vegans consider mold or yeast mm. vegan. If, in that case, maybe not the microbial ones or the fermentation produced chymosin, but if, if those aren't in play, then you could always use the, the plant-based rennets, which is either thistle rennets or fig sap or um, 
There's, there's actually, you can even do it with, it's fun to do at home. Artichoke leaves can even do it if you crush up some artichoke leaves. All those can coagulate milk. But as it is, we're interested in making milk cheeses. That's so, right. um, yeah, Alice has added something else in there. Do vegetarian friendly lipases exist? Similar to. Um, if they do. They're just not very common. Um, I shouldn't say that. Uh, uh, you, you can find them. Yeah, any, if you talk to any of your people you buy your ingredients from, um, you basically want the FPC equivalent to lipase, which is a recombinant DNA, but they took the gene from an, an animal, put it into a microbe, and they just produced a really pure strain of a lipase, basically just a, an animal agnostic lipase, and yeah. those are definitely possible. A lot of traditional cheesemakers skew those, saying they get the best flavor from the, the ones that come from animals directly. But yeah, there's, there's definitely options out there. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Pat. Well, time's about up. And um, thank you, folks, for attending. Um, if you've had more than one person listening from your site today, can you please let me know? Okay, so with that, thank you so much, Pat, and we hope to have you again.